You're supporting ideologues who claim that all truth is subjective, that all sex differences are socially constructed, and that Western imperialism is the sole source of all third world problems. The man in that video, Dr. Jordan Peterson, is with us right now. He's a University of Toronto psychology professor and author of the world hit book. I'm very pleased about all the support. It's quite remarkable, all this um, interest in these complicated matters and complicated discussions. And it's so nice to see people concentrating on psychological and philosophical issues and leaving the idiot politics as far behind as possible because it's certainly a... Uh, what would you call it a distraction and a dangerous one at that so it's so funny talking to the mainstream media types because everything they talk about has to be viewed through a political lens and although I continue to insist I did BBC hard talk which was aired today and that was a classic example of an interviewer being entirely scripted and trying to push everything that's happening around me I suppose into a political narrative and it isn't political as far as I'm concerned. Not everything is political despite the insistence of people who feel that the personal is always political. It's like, um, no, there's philosophical domain and a theological domain and a psychological domain and those should be kept the hell separate from politics. In that, in, in that introduction you say, uh, I quoted you as saying there are dangerous people teaching your children. Who are you talking about? Well, increasingly, and this isn't only the case in the universities, people are being taught by ideologues, not by educators. And ideologues have a very simple way of looking at the world. They reduce it to a few principles like inequality and unfairness and power. Those would be the fundamental principles at the moment that are operating on the radical left. And they're on an ideological campaign. And that's increasingly the case in, in elementary, junior high and high schools as well, mostly because the faculties of education are full of people who are radical. So, and this is it's well documented. I, I mentioned this earlier, is the, the media as it disintegrates, and it certainly is disintegrating at an incredibly rapid rate, um, everything is political. There, it's as if the philosophical and the psychological and the theological don't exist. And, you know, increasingly in my interviews I've been talking about what's been happening at my lectures on my tour and the audience isn't there for political reasons at all. They're there because they want to figure out how to have a responsible and meaningful life. And it's as if that story just doesn't exist. The, the, the framework, which is basically a political framework and increasingly a politically correct framework, doesn't allow that to exist as a reality. And that, that's why, well, I'm much more comfortable lecturing to the crowds that have been coming to see me than I am talking to journalists. But I also think the universities made a, a dreadful mistake expanding their humanities purview to include disciplines like women's studies and these ethnic mm -hmm. studies disciplines, which aren't disciplines. They're pseudo-disciplines at best, and they have very, very low academic standards, and they're corrupting the rest of the enterprise. And so, and that's, and that's, that's not a good thing. What do you mean corrupting the rest of the enterprise? Well, you need to have standards in education, and the fact that disciplines emerged that had no real methodology and no method of proof, no philosophical background, no real history, meant that, and that they became degree-granting enterprises, mm -hmm. and that they, that, they, that they emerged to produce political activists, which is exactly what they advertise on their websites, means that you've got a, like a, you've got a fifth column of ideologues operating behind the scenes, and mm -hmm. all they, they, they spend almost all of their time engaged in political activism, you know, and, and that's not good for the university as a whole, right. by any stretch, or, by, or for society as a whole. It means you have to confront things <coughs> right then and there, which is, I suppose, why so many of my interviews have been, in some sense, contra confrontational, because people will impose a thinking agenda on the flow of the conversation. This is especially true in the mainstream media. It happened again recently with BBC's hard talk. They, they, they impose an agenda on the conversation and then that just doesn't work out very well because I'm paying attention and I will object to the agenda. Not because I have a, a different agenda except for what I said, which is that I want to say what I think. 
I want to say as truthfully as I can what I actually am thinking in this more abstracted and detached sense and see what happens. So it's, it's a hard thing to clarify because you might say, well, Dr. Peterson, you just said you want to say what you're thinking. But it's not exactly the same thing. It's not like I'm thinking strategically. I'm listening. Thoughts e emerge and I say them. I'm not trying to manipulate. I'm not putting spin on things. I'm not trying to manipulate the conversation in any particular way. And again, the reason for that is because I decided a long time ago, probably 30 years, that there was no more effective way of dealing with a complex situation than to try to say what you believe to be true and not to manipulate it no, none of that it just doesn't because that's all those are all lies as far as I'm concerned that kind of manipulation and spin so we live in a time when the sum of human knowledge is increasing exponentially and so much of that knowledge is right here at our fingertips but are we really really taking advantage of that knowledge or are our minds made up for good? Now, there's one small complication. Not all of this new information is created equal. In an age when we're inundated with conflicting messages and there's so much information out there that is designed to mislead and deceive us, being able to assess what is quality information and what is not is one of the most important skills we can teach each other, share with each other, and with our children. One of the things I was arguing with about Sam, arguing with, about with Sam Harris, was the relationship between facts and values, because Sam, and he has his reasons, would like to propose that we can derive values directly from facts. And he wants to do that because he wants to nail the world of values to something solid so it doesn't float in air and 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 get let's say um, what would you call it hijacked by the fundamentalists or dissolve into nihilism and and both of those are terrible ends for a hierarchy of value so he wants to nail it to something more objective and and less relativistic and less less grounded in revealed truth that removes it from the domain of fundamentalism and so I can understand his point and why he wants to do that but the problem is is that it isn't easy to derive values from facts because there's an infinite number of facts and by necessity a very finite number of values in fact most of the time when you're doing something you're reducing the whole world to one value and that value is encapsulated in whatever goal you happen to be pursuing at the moment or whatever you're paying attention to which is also a form of goal-directed pursuit and so I've also figured out that and I kind of knew this, but I could articulate it better now, that you look at the world of facts through a hierarchy of values, and that hierarchy of values is instantiated in your nervous system and simultaneously a social construct because you pay attention to things of value that you and everyone else have established as valuable through a process of social negotiation. And you need to pay attention to what you think that's valuable that everyone else thinks is valuable because otherwise you wouldn't have any basis for shared attention and you wouldn't have any basis for trade with other people so that's another thing so that's really been helpful because so now I've figured out that you reduce the infinite world of facts to the finite world of values by viewing the world of facts through what's essentially a dominance hierarchy of value and that's and that, that exists both out in the social world and neurologically at the same time and so that's been unbelievably useful to figure out too and uh, part of a mystery that I've been trying to untangle for about three decades. Jordan, you've been around the world talking your book up. Uh, you know, people stop you on the street all the time now. What's the one thing you have learned since your book uh, 12 Rules for Life and Antidote to Chaos came out? How has the response been and how has it impacted you? Well, there's, I've learned two things. I've learned that people are starving for a real conversation about responsibility and meaning and about the relationship between those two things because people need a sustaining meaning in their life and it's not to be found through rights and impulsive gratification it's to be found through the adoption of responsibility I'm not going to do these interviews to sell books or to promote myself or or it I don't have a strategic goal in mind 
except that I'm going to have a conversation and I'm going to say what I think and, and, and take the consequences. Because I assume that if I say something and I believe it's true, then the consequences are as positive as they can be, regardless of how they look at the time. And that's an issue of faith, because I believe that the habitable order is generated by spoken truth. I believe that. I think that's the truest, that's the truest thing I know. Would you agree with C.S. Lewis that if you look for truth, you may find comfort. If you look for comfort, you will find despair. Oh yes, that's definitely the case. It's quite an intelligent phrase because he says, if you look for truth, you may find comfort. He didn't say you will find comfort. Yeah, well, sometimes if you look for truth, you don't find comfort to begin with. That's for sure. You find a lot of trouble. But sometimes you have to go through a lot of trouble to, get, to set things right. If you look for comfort, despair, well, the reason for that is that you can't look for comfort in life. Life isn't about comfort. Life is a deadly game. It's a game of life and death. It's a game of good and evil. It's everything's on the line. Your sanity's on the line. Your, your freedom from pain is on the line. Your freedom from despair is on the line. Your family's on the line. The other thing that's so interesting about that is that it it transforms pessimism into optimism. It's like, well, the world is a very dark place. It's full of suffering and it's full of malevolence. And it might even be so full of suffering and malevolence that a reasonable person could question the justification of its being, uh, as Ivan Karamazov does in, in The Brothers Karamazov, which I would highly recommend, by the way. That's an absolutely great book, Dostoevsky. Um, but the, the truth of the matter seems to be that if you face the pessimism full frontal, so to speak, um, then you find something in you that can, that's strong enough to take it on. And that really says something about, what would you say, the relationship between human beings and divinity, I would say. Because it takes something transcendent, of transcendent power to be able to rise above the genuine suffering and malevolence of life. And I do think that we have that within us, if we don't shy away from the challenge. There's no comfort. Life is an adventure. And I think the greatest adventure that you could possibly have is one is the one that you find if you look for the truth. And that's a good place to stop.